Hey everybody, my name is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics and I'm answering questions. So here's an interesting video. Um, is it Nevo, N-E-V-O-H-R-A-A-L-N-A-V-N-O. I don't know how to pronounce that. He asked a question that like, it got me riled up. But he gave $10, so thank you for the $10, but you got me riled up. So you said, thanks. Thanks for the great video, Matthew. I have a question on speaker choice for a residential home theater. I know you have Perlisten in your home theater, uh, which have a narrow vertical dispersion. They don't really. Um, it's so narrow. No, it's not. On some of the models that I'm concerned, all seats won't be covered even with proper aiming. For example, surround height bookshelf angled down towards the MLP may be off 20 degrees vertically for one seat to the left or right. How do you feel about dispersion patterns versus, say, a coaxial design like a Sendo's P5, P6 with a wider dispersion in the vertical directivity direction and a more similar horizontal versus vertical dispersion overall compared to the perlicence? Okay. I don't, I, I, I really think people way, way over blue and way misunderstood the vertical dispersion characteristics of the Perlison speakers to the point that there was a lot of massive exaggeration around the issue. And I think that that then fell into the forums in such a way where some people, I think, were even being dishonest, meaning they knew that it wasn't a big deal, but they wanted to disparage the speaker, so they mischaracterized it, and that created even more problems. There also were people who I think just made honest mistakes. They just didn't understand it, they uh, parroted it, and it created this problem that the speakers have very controlled vertical dispersion, but calling it narrow in the way it's being described here misunderstands what's happening. So I need to talk about this, and it's not unique to Perlisten because lots of speakers will have this as a design characteristic, especially well-designed, controlled directivity pro audio speakers, or just good, controlled, uh, constant directivity speakers in general, including residential ones. So the Perlisten's use a beam-forming array that's specifically designed to control vertical dispersion, not horizontal, in a way that allows you to have less floor and ceiling um, reflections, right? And it gave people the idea that if like, you had your LCRs aiming at you, that this row might be good, but the row behind me, which in my case isn't, but like if it was properly set up in 14 inches to 18 inches above me, would put them like way off axis and they would get terrible sound, right? And that's actually not correct. Um, you would have to be, I did the calculations in a response to this, you'd have to be like six to eight feet above this ear level to be at a point where you're at the upper edge of the area where the response is still considered part of its minus. So let's, we need to talk about what directivity is defined as. The half angle is referred to the point at which the sound is down by six dB. So in the case of the Perlissons, a conservative number would be plus or minus 30 degrees. But you got to remember, while it is very, very flat, if you were to pick 20 kilohertz, it's going to be probably less than 30 degrees. And if you pick one kilohertz, it's actually going to be way, way more. It's going to be like 60 degrees. And then there's this range in between there where it's a relatively flat and smooth uh, reduction in sound with position. So here's the first issue. Remember, you're not getting bad sound or no sound outside of that window. What's happening is you're actually getting a situation where the sound is shelving down over a relatively wide bandwidth. If it's the case of the S4i, it's only going to do it from around one kilohertz on up, uh, or the R4i. If it's the S5i, it's actually going to be able to shift that down to about five, 600 hertz. And if it's the S7i, for instance, and they don't make an R7i, then it's going to be able to do it all the way down to like 100 hertz. So it's really, really wide directivity control in the vertical domain, bandwidth-wise. So here's the issue with that misunderstanding. If you were to take the uh, S5i, for instance. Well, we'll take the S4i. We'll make it a worst case scenario because the, the Ascendo speaker you picked, the P5, P6, is a really small and much cheaper speaker. If you have that in the wall there and your distance between here and that wall is for the RSP, for the sake of argument. So in my room, my room is like 16 feet wide. So it's eight feet, roughly speaking, from my head to that side speaker for the sake of argument, right? And then this seat, there's about a, we'll just say it's, it's not, I don't think three, yeah, I'll say it's three feet. So if I'm eight feet here, I'm sorry. Yeah, eight feet here, I'm six feet here. Now, the change in SPL that happens for that, we can do the calculation right now. Let's just say that the sort at the speaker was 90 dB. We're gonna do some SPL loss calculations. And remember in a room, it's not quite like this because there's reflections which affect things. 
but we're going to just pretend like it is. So if the speaker is 90 dB and we are, as I said, we're eight feet away, then it's around 82, so it's 82.3 dB at this position. If we switch it from eight feet to six feet, I don't know why I said that. It's three feet over. It's five feet. Sorry, guys. Then we go to 86.3. So remember, at eight feet, we were 82. And at five feet, we're 86. So we're about uh, four dB difference between those two. So we've lost eight, uh, four dB between this seat and this gets louder. Now, if you're way off in angle, and again, you'd have to be, you said 20 degrees, then you probably are down 4 dB. What that means is that if you aim them correctly so that the loudest portion of the lobe is at the RSP, and actually the right way to do it is the loudest portion of the lobe should be at this seat. So the left surround speaker should be having the loudest portion of the lobe at the rightmost seat. Then what happens is that as you move closer to the speaker, the, you're down farther in angle vertically because you've raised the speaker up, right? And you're off, like you said, maybe 20 degrees. That's actually pretty extreme. I don't think it would be that extreme, but let's just say it was, to use your example. Then you would have the correction in SPL happen naturally so that as you get closer to it and it gets louder, you're in a quieter portion of the lobe and you're actually getting to a louder portion of the lobe of the other speaker on the opposite. And so the surround speakers stay more consistent. That vertical directivity is a feature, not a fault. And it's a feature for two reasons. One is it avoids some of the strong ceiling reflections and floor reflections, which can be detrimental to good sound. But the other thing is it actually improves coverage. It doesn't worsen it. If you're aiming the speakers correctly, what you're doing is you're actually able to take advantage of that. The speaker's frequency response doesn't become garbage as you uh, get far off axis. You have to get really, really far off axis for it to become garbage. Instead, the speaker actually just gets quieter in SPL. Now, whether the uh, Ascendo P5 or P6 is wider dispersion may not actually be true. I'd have to look. Let's look it up. Let's look at the P6. I mean, those are good speakers. I don't... What did I do? Oops. Apparently there are other Ascendos. <laughs> you need to look at the right Ascendo. There we go. One of the things I really like about Jeffrey is his willingness to put all the data out there so that you can look at this stuff. All right, let's see. We're going to look at the P6, I think, instead. It's taken a while. Sorry. Ah, there we go. No, I don't want to subscribe. Come on. Huh. All right. May have picked a bad time to look at the site. Sorry about that. Um, well, what I was going to say was you may find that the difference in the SPL isn't as great as you think. And there may be other issues you need to look at, like some speakers, not necessarily the Ascendo, because I don't, I can't look at it to see. Most speakers, we wouldn't know this, but some of the speakers might have a wider vertical dispersion in the classic sense. Like if you heavily smoothed it and looked at it, it wouldn't be down as much when you get farther off axis vertically. But what could happen is the frequency response gets really lousy. I mean, even using the Perlisten example, and this is true of any speaker of this design, when you have that kind of asymmetry where you've got your tweeter and below it a woofer, there becomes a, a situation where depending on how you design the crossover, either above or below, there's going to actually be like a, a null in the response. It's usually at a pretty extreme angle, but it, the angle at which that happens varies depending on the speaker's design. And it's unlikely you would sit in it, but you could. You could design a speaker where you've placed it too high up and you're sitting at an extreme angle and you're in that null. And so one of the nice things about the Perlissons is that as you move into the symmetric designs, that null gets shifted or actually goes away. So like in the 7 series, it's gone. There is no null. In the uh, 5 series, there is a null, but it's very minimal and it's much better controlled. And then in the 4, there is a null. And... Um, it is below, but it's way below. Like you'd have to be sitting on the floor practically under the speaker for this to be an issue. So it's not bad, but there are other speakers where that's not true and it's a bigger problem. So anyway, I, my, my issue is I just think that this whole vertical narrow thing misunderstands the point. If we were talking about horizontal, we could talk about all sorts of issues with wide versus narrow and which is better and why. But when it comes to vertical, there are real advantages to having good controlled and actually narrower dispersion vertically. Um, 
in, in terms of getting better coverage, not worse. And like I said, what you want to do is you want to aim the loud portion of the lobe at the farthest opposite seat. So even for, I give you the surround ones, but for the LCR, same thing. You aim the left LCR at that seat over there, my rightmost back one, or possibly the right seat here, depending on which one is farther to the extreme. And then what happens is as you move across the seats, the speaker's own natural change in directivity. So in the case of the vertical, it's that one back there. I should correct that. You're going to aim it over there. The horizontal directivity and the vertical directivity work together to make sure that the SPL is more consistent as you move across the seats, not less. If you aim all your speakers at the RSP, yes, you were going to make all the other seats worse, but that's not good design approach, and that's not what you want to be doing, at least not in my opinion. So I hope that's helpful, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Sorry, you got me all riled up, but I just wanted to make that clear because when the S7Ts came out, there were even stereophile made some comment about how the vertical directivity was causing a shift as you stood up and it's like there's no way because the distance at which the frequency would change more than like 2 dB would have required somebody to be standing on somebody else's shoulders for that shift to have happened. And I actually wrote John Atkinson, who's a friend, and Cal Rubinson, uh, who's also a friend who I've known in the industry for a little while, and I said, hey guys, great review. I think that that comment may have been more in your head than reality. I think if you measured, you'd find that there isn't any such distance because look, here's your measurement data. Here's the anechoic measurement data. Here is the angles. I did the geometry calculations for them. And I said, unless somebody was standing on somebody else's shoulders at those positions, that's not possible for that to have been true. And John wrote back and he goes, your geometry skills are better than mine, <laughs> which is a, a joke. But um, I think the point being, he hadn't thought of it maybe that way. Um, but like, again, there was a lot of misunderstanding where, and this is common in audio, you get things in your head and you think you hear something because what you've gotten in your head. But if that's not actually technically true, it becomes unlikely to be something you're actually hearing. And in the case of this idea that you're hearing a shift in vertical, a shift in sound because of the change in the vertical directivity, you got to understand how far off axis you need to be for that to be true and what that looks like from a geometric standpoint. In my case, the shift from the eight foot seat, here, I'll, we'll do that calculation. We'll keep this video going. So it's a right triangle calculation, guys. That tweeter is up over my head. So it's not actually aimed at anybody's head. It's up higher. For a re It's on purpose. So the ear level here is, we're going to say, 36 inches. <clears throat> And that over there is, I don't remember exactly now. We'll say 48 inches. I think that's about right. So if this is 36 and that's 48, there's a 12 inch difference in height. And then we've got a change in the length uh, of the base of the triangle, right? So I'm eight and, and five. So 12 inches and eight. So the Oh, I did that wrong. 12 inches is one. All right, there we go. I was like that angle does not make any sense. All right. So I am seven degrees below tweeter axis here. Now, if we change this to five, eight, I'm 11.3 degrees. Now, are you telling me you really think the response of that speaker is changing dramatically between seven degrees below axis and 11 degrees below axis? To give you an idea, the actual change is about 1 dB, but you have to smooth it to even see that because there's enough change in the frequency response at those two positions that there's more than a 1 dB variation in the response. And so they actually kind of, you've got one that looks like nice and straight, and then when you shift it, there's a little bit of a peak and a dip in there that's, like I said, about a dB, but it means it hits the response of the other one. So they look like they almost lie on top of each other. You have to go to like one octave smoothing to see that there is in fact about a 1 dB shift, but it's very small. And if we were to go over here to this seat, we have to take that number I gave you before, of eight, and we have to add another three feet to it. So that's 11. Remember, the height didn't change. That's five degrees. Five, seven, 11. So 
for you to be at that 20 degrees position, I think you'd have to be like two feet. Let's see. Twenty six degrees at two feet. All right, so two two and a half feet roughly. Are you sitting two and a half feet from your surround speakers? <laughs> if so, you've got other problems. Like the the whole vertical directivity issue is like a different problem. If that's true, you've got other problems. Now, if the other thing is you placed your speakers higher than I did and they're much higher up over your ear level, um, then I'm saying that could exacerbate it. But even then. Like, let's just change this and say the speakers are two feet above your head. Seems kind of extreme to me. Then you'd be 14 degrees here, and you'd be... ...21 degrees there. So that scenario would work, but again, why are you placing your side surrounds two feet above your head? That To me, that's too high. I, don't, I wouldn't do that. The typical way that I do it would be... It, it, it is based significantly. So what happens is you've got in a room, if you've got one row of seats, you want them above ear level, but really close to it if you've got three. If you've got one seat, everything should be ear level, in my opinion. I think Anthony doesn't agree with me on this, but that's my opinion. And that is what Dolby says to do, and I think there's a sense in it. If you've got three seats, you want to be able to have the sound come over the heads of the seats ne of the people next to you. So I like to be about six inches to a foot above ear level with one row. And then with two rows, the same number can actually kind of make sense. So in a two-row theater, very often you need the riser to be 12 to 14 inches. Mine is short, but let's just say it is that. I would probably go six inches above the head there. So that's like 18 inches um, back, but that's if I'm trying to do it for back there. However, with two rows, the correct way to do it is two sets of side surrounds, two, not one. So if you do two sets of side surround, this one is six inches above your head, and then the one back there would be six inches above that head, and you would work it in an array. So that's a, a, you know, that again, you can see like we, we don't have an issue anymore. Um, and then as I also mentioned, the 20 degrees is not a problem. I just wanted to point out that you actually would have to have the speakers placed in a kind of weird way for that to be true. So you'd have to have them in my room two feet above my head to create that 20 degrees at these seats. And even if I did that, all that does is actually correct for the shift as I move closer to the speaker it doesn't create a coverage problem. It actually creates a coverage improvement. So in a way, I'd be better off having them higher up than I have them. Um, in my own room, the way they're set up, and I've even done measurements, there's virtually no change in the SPL when you move between the seats, and there's more change in the response shape just from the reflections in the room than, than the change from that. No coverage problem. So it's an overblown issue, and it's actually often an overblown issue with most speakers. Where you get into problems, like I said, is there's some not-so-well-designed speakers that have a null below or sometimes above, depending on the design of the speaker, usually in an extreme angle, but in some of the speakers, it's not that extreme. And based on how high you put them up, because we've talked about this before about trying to get them up over your head, where some of the extreme seats, like the left and the right seat, would be uh, getting a really bad response. I mean, there are people who put seats up against a wall, but like, honestly, I'm not even going to care about that. If you're doing that, that is a compromised seat. You know, it's a compromised seat. Who cares what's happening to the frequency response of the speakers? That's just overflow seating. As, um, Peter Alec calls it your drunk uncle. And as Jean Delacella calls it, it's your mother-in-law seat. I just, I don't care what's happening there. That's just overflow, right? All right. So hopefully this video was helpful and you, uh, uh find this useful. Please subscribe to my videos. The donations you guys give really help me to continue. So thank you very much. That $10 was much appreciated. And hopefully I gave you more than you were looking for in an answer. Uh, keep watching. I got more coming. Thanks.